what's going on everybody welcome you're tuned into whistle kick martial arts radio and on today's episode it's another word association and these have been getting harder and harder as andrew tries to give me the most difficult words possible to relate to martial arts and quite a few of these come from some of you so stick around if you're new to the show i am jeremy lesniak founder of whistle kick host here for martial arts radio joined by my oft co-host and producer for the show andrew adams andrew how are you I'm great. I'm doing well. I'm excited to ask you these. You can't see them because it's... I cannot I see them. It around. They're on the other side of the post-it. But most, not all, but most of these words came from longtime listener and guest of the show, Mark Warner. Oh. Well, I hope they're all English. Uh, they are. <laughs> but okay. I bring that up to say if you listening are like, oh, I wonder what Jeremy would say to this. If you have a word that you think you'd like to be added into the next one, shoot it my way. Yep. You should do that. Ooh, pardon my yawning. Well, if you're new to this show and to Whistlekick and to what we do, you are in for a treat because this is the most ridiculous show format we offer up. And we have a good time, even if nothing else. If, if we're not solving the world's problems with these episodes, that's okay because we're having fun. Now, if you go to whistlekicker.com, you will see that we have a number of things that are in effort to solve some of the world's problems, because we believe wholeheartedly that traditional martial arts makes us better, brings out better versions of ourselves. So our goal here at Whistlekick is to get everybody in the world to train for at least six months. Our mission to connect, educate, and entertain all of you serves all of that. It all lines up, and we have purpose with everything that we do. And that's why at whistlekick.com, you'll find much more than a store where, yeah, you can grab stuff to buy, help support the company, save 15% with the code podcast15. But you'll also see that we have events and a lot of free content. In fact, we often say our best stuff is free. And that includes the podcast, it includes uh, marshalljournal.com, it includes so many things. Just start poking around, you'll see what I'm talking about. If you go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you're going to find every episode we've ever done. We don't put any of them behind the paywall. But if you want more, if you like what we do and you think, Jeremy, I want more, 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 we have a Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. Gets you more. It starts at two bucks a month and you get to know what's going on behind the scenes. At $5 a month, we give you bonus episodes. At $10 a month, you're getting video and other stuff, books, the School Owner's Mastermind, private training. There's so much available in there at the Patreon. So please consider supporting us. Check it out. It continues to grow little by little. And we are knocking on the doors profitability. Yay! Which is the goal of every company, to be profitable. Everybody should just buy me a beer once a month. Everybody should buy you a beer. And to be and clear... You can, do that. you can do that by joining the Patreon for like five bucks a month. Buy me a, a beer. By the way, you're not buying Jeremy a beer. You're buying me a beer. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that that derailed me a little bit, which does yeah. not go well for this format of the show. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, the folks who are, I would say, our biggest fans, the folks who really most resonate with our mission, know about the family page whistlekick.com slash family if you're listening to the show and have for a while you probably are family and you would probably find value in going to that page and why is it not linked because we want to make you work just a tiny bit for it because we want to make sure that the people who go truly mean to go they don't just kind of accidentally stumble on it yeah i think that's enough of an intro yeah word association so this is word. where you throw me a word and I have to relate it to martial arts and there's no time format on this. No, no. Mm. I simply just say what I want to say. And when it comes time, when you think it's time, you throw me another word and I just keep going until you're out of words. And then we call it a day. And the, the most fun words are the ones that make you really stumble and think. And I, I like thinking. I like having to think. I like the challenge that these episodes bring, for sure. All right. So, as I said at the beginning, not every word here is from Mark Warner, but uh, certainly the first few are. The first one is mud. 
Mm. Mud. Mud is, is interesting because mud is something that um, a lot of us find to be, uh, I guess we'll say disagreeable, something that we don't want. We don't want mud on our boots. We don't want mud on our car. We don't want to be stuck in the mud, whether literally or the childhood game of tag. And yet mud is also something that people will go to spas and pay a lot of money to have applied to their skin. Uh, children and dogs love playing in mud. And it's pretty simple. It's just dirt and water. How many things do we have in martial arts that are really simple and incredibly polarizing? Some people love them. Some people don't, right? If we break down what a form is at its most basic, it's just a memorized set of movements. And there are people out there who think memorizing a set of movements is an absolutely terrible idea. Why would you want to do that? Why would you not always be uh, spontaneous with your techniques? And then there are other people who think it's my favorite thing in the world. I know both you and I enjoy forms extensively. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so really it comes down to your perspective. Mud, like forms or really just, just about anything else in martial arts, is based on how you see it. The same people who complain about dirty vehicles would have, would, would probably find positive results in a skin treatment involving mud. The same people who complain about muddy um, dirt roads that make it difficult to get to their home, me sometimes, also recognize that it's that mud that keeps where they live from becoming overdeveloped and overpopulated. Okay, you mentioned you vehicles. You mentioned vehicles. The next one on the list that he gave me is Ferrari. Okay. Um, I I kind of wish this had come first because I, I, I would have used a very similar analogy to mud, right? Some people want a Ferrari. Other people say the upkeep on that for such a, a, a unreliable vehicle is a, a poor idea, though Ferraris are more reliable than Lamborghinis from what I understand. I do not own either. <laughs> uh, but a Ferrari is a great example of kind of working backwards from a goal. What's the purpose of a Ferrari? To go really, really fast. Okay, what, what, what cars go really, really fast? Race cars, okay. How do we take some of that essence of, of being, of racing and bring it down a notch so it can be legally driven on public roads by people who are not professional race car drivers. Ah, and that's where you get a lot of these supercars, right? That's kind of the fascination, the, the appeal of even something like a Corvette, right? It can go really fast. It's got a bit of race DNA, some people might say, but it, it has a purpose. It's to go really fast. And you could kind of say something similar about sparring. Sparring is meant to simulate not racing but a fight and some of us find that really enjoyable you and i have sparred it was fun yeah i've sparred plenty of people and it's usually a lot of fun i don't actually want to fight you i don't really want i don't want to fight anyone but to pretend to fight someone can be a heck of a lot of fun if i was to get into a professional car race, I would probably be terrified. <laughs> but to take a Ferrari and go for a drive would probably be a lot of fun. So there's something interesting that when we pull back a little bit from the extreme of a definition, create a little bit of space, there can be a lot of fun. All right. Mark must have been on a car kick because the next word is distributor cap. <sighs> it's a good thing I have a mild understanding of what cars do and what parts of them are. Uh, distributor cap, unless I am mistaken, is uh, part of the electrical system and responsible for making sure that 
electricity gets where it needs to go. The electricity is distributed. Am I correct? I believe you are correct. Yep. Okay. All right. Good. Because otherwise I was going to be really stuck. <clears throat> we know that whether we're talking about a car or a home, electricity goes wherever it can. Right. It, it, and in a car, there are a lot of systems that require electricity. And so we make sure that they go where they need to go. But in fancy electrical systems, it's not just all of the electricity all of the time. There is some gatekeeping being done. There is some oversight being done. When you step into your training, you don't just train everything all at once there is some consideration. Now, for most of us, that consideration is given by our instructor. Okay, we're going to work on this now, and then we're going to work on this, and then we're going to work on this. Sometimes, and if you are an instructor, you know that you have to do this. If you're a newer instructor, you hate having to do this. Okay, I want you to go work on this, and you are going to go work on this, and you're going to go work on that, and you're going to work on this. And if you have more than a couple groups, you're probably not leading one of them. You're probably observant you're going around to each of them and you're saying, okay, uh, um, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, right? You are managing them and what they are putting in and taking out. We, we could kind of draw an analogy there between the instructor in that case and a distributor cap, being sure that what needs to happen happens at the right time. All right. This next one's not from Mark, but we'll stick. I'm going to bring it next because it ties. It's the last one that ties into cars. Guardrail. <laughs> um, when do you hit the guardrail? When you're paying attention to the guardrail. Um, there, there's a there's someone that I, I think very highly of. I've been listening to a lot of their audio programs. Not not in the martial arts space. Um, and he tells a story talking about learning to drive a race car and being terrified of crashing into the wall, which reminds me of being in driver's ed and being terrified of guardrails. Actually, Jersey barriers freak me out. I don't know mm. if you know that. And why? Because they're very unforgiving and they're right there and they don't move. You know, if we drift over the white line or the yellow line or we take a corner a little bit too, too, too high or too low, Nothing really happens, but if there's a guardrail there and we're a little bit too high, oh, now we are at best scraping the paint off of our car or potentially crashing and injuring ourselves. And if you remember driver's ed, if anybody out there remembers driver's ed, you were probably taught that your car is going to go where you look. And so it can be really difficult when you are on, say, like a narrow bridge and you know that those, that guardrail is right there. And you're not quite sure how far away it is. You haven't hit it. You know that. But you really want to look and know the moment that you look at that guardrail, that's the moment you're going to hit the guardrail. You have to stay confident and focused on what you're doing and what your job is, which at that, car is, at that moment is to pilot the vehicle and to keep it going in the right trajectory. How many of us have had similar experiences in our training. You might think, oh, well, never. How about how close am I to my next rank test? What happens when you take a look and you pull off and you're like, oh, hey, instructor, how close am I to testing? A lot of traditional schools, you get kicked back away, right? That's I was raised. You don't ask. Now, yep. plenty of modern schools ha do that differently. So this may not apply to all of you. But how about if you're sparring and how, how, how close am I to you? You start looking at your feet relative to your partner or opponent's feet, depending on how you look at it and you get punched in the nose, right? There are a lot of things where we simply have to trust that the way we are going, whether literally or figuratively, keeps us in a safe trajectory and avoids the obstacles that we have around us. If you drive enough, you will hit a guardrail. It's never a zero. So given enough miles, you'll bump a guardrail or you know, you'll be driving and uh, a child will step into the road and you'll have, you'll swerve and you'll clip the guardrail. Something will happen, right? Like it's it's again, it's statistically inevitable given enough time on the road that these things will happen. But 
we mitigate that risk, just as we mitigate the risk in our training, by trusting that the things around us that are not moving, that guardrail doesn't move. It's not a threat to you. That we've put as little time and energy into the immobile things that we might think are threatening us and instead worry about the things that are in front of us, the other vehicles, what's around the corner, our sparring partner, or the things that we can control, such as, am I going too fast? Again, car or otherwise. Cheese. Is tasty. Cheese. <sighs> hmm. I like cheese. I put it on things. I put some cheese on my breakfast. Cheese is interesting because there are very few people out there who dislike cheese. And if you didn't know this, cheese actually um, operates in the brain in a way that is very similar to the way opiates operate on the brain. You can actually be, I don't know that you can become literally addicted to cheese, but there is a biochemical response that happens in the brain when you eat cheese that is part of why we enjoy cheese so much, why we like putting it on everything. Cheese is incredible. Oh, I had a direction and I lost it. Where was I going? Okay, hold on. And part of the responsible way to use cheese is to put it on stuff, right? But we've all been guilty of sitting down and eating a block of cheese. Oh, yeah. Or maybe we sliced up a block of cheese and then ate the whole block of cheese, right? But usually we don't do that. Usually cheese is almost a seasoning. We add it to things. And maybe we add a lot of it. How good would pizza be without cheese? Not so good. Yeah. Saucy yeah. bread. It's a big breadstick, right? Yep. <clears throat> okay. There are things, and they vary for everyone, that are that are the cheese of training. For me, the cheese of training is partner work. And I don't mean sparring. I mean, let's we're gonna do some kind of slow self-defense sort of stuff and or or a- application, you know, bunkai oyo. Um I really need to learn those terms in Korea. Maybe somebody can help me out with that, et cetera. Because for me, it's it's the environment in which all that stuff kind of comes together in a really enjoyable way. If we're doing self-defense scenarios at, you know, moderate to higher speed or, or realism, it's really stressful. And there's some kind of type two fun in there, right? When you're done, it's like, okay, I'm glad I did that. But for me, there's nothing more fun. There's nothing more cheese than being able to take scenarios and drills and break them down to super slow-mo and be able to think through them and volunteer my body to my partner or partners and vice versa. So it's a good time. But your cheese may vary. Fair. Silver. I'm assuming he doesn't just mean the color, but the actual tangible item, silver. It's the first loser. (laughs) Um, We could talk about the medal. We could talk about second place. We could talk about currency, because for the majority of human history, silver has been at least part of the equation of exchanging money for goods or services. But I I want to talk about it from that second place angle. Because if you're the the only person who's ever unhappy with second place is the person who gets second place. Mm -hmm. The person who gets first place is like, man, that person, like even even if it didn't look that close, they're like, I know that person given given the time could have catch me. me. Yeah. Right. Uh, or a different day could have gotten me and third place and beyond like, man, I, I wish I got in second place. 
But when you get that second place trophy or medal, that silver medal, most of us have this instinct of, ugh, I was so close. And I think that there's something really important that happens for most of us in that moment. It's, what do you do with it? What do you do with that? Let's call it frustration, because for most of us, second place is frustrating. Mm-hmm. I was so close. I guess I'm not good enough. I'm going to quit. I'm not going to compete again. It's not my fault, right? That that dismissive element or... I got closer this time. I can get them next time. It's really just me and that person there or that team. I'm going to go back and I'm going to work harder. And so I think more so than any other finish in any kind of contest, second place, a silver medal tells us a lot about the person or the people and how they did. Coffee. Coffee is a huge part of my morning routine. If you have ever watched First Cup, which airs 6.30 U.S. Eastern Time, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Monday through Friday. You know, Monday through Friday, you know that it is the, as far as we know, the only martial arts morning show. I've been going for years now, and I generally start my day with a cup of coffee. Sometimes it's tea, but almost always coffee. And I don't have any coffee until the show starts. It's promise that I've made to the show. That's why it's called First Cup. And so I could spend the time just kind of talking about First Cup. I won't. You can look it up. But coffee is part of my routine. Even on the weekends. I drink generally coffee in the morning. It's part of what um, what I found. It's an enjoyable part of my morning routine. And routine is important. You know, we just, we recorded an episode just a little bit ago talking about the importance of routine, that if you want to make progress, it's about routine. If you want to get better at your flexibility, you work on your flexibility every day. If you want to get better at your kicking, you work on your kicking every day. I don't care if you don't have an hour, you can do five minutes. If you don't have five minutes, it's not important to you. We undervalue routine in our lives. And I am as probably more guilty of this than most people. I don't like doing things over and over again, but I recognize that when I do certain things over and over again, I get better at them and it makes other things available to me that would not have become available otherwise. It's kind of like uh, um, role-playing game style video games. Anybody who's played those games knows there's a lot of time where you're just going around doing boring things to get enough money or experience or whatever to get Mm -hmm. to that next place. And why are those games so popular? Because they do mimic elements of life. Yep. All right. The last one from Mark, because he and I are both Doctor Who fans, Jelly Babies. I've never seen Doctor Who. Okay. So Jelly Beans. Oh, okay. That's not Um, what they are, but it's a close enough resemblance. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Stumping me with with cultural elements that I don't know is, is... I'm not going to pretend I know. That's okay. I, 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 that's more for, for others. I'm letting the audience know. Oh, that's fair. I pivoted. Jelly I beans. appreciate that. I appreciate that. I think jelly beans are an example of something that should not be as popular as it is. Right? You look at jelly beans and the description, it's a candy bean. That sounds terrible. (laughs) If they were in any other form, aesthetically, they would be better received. And yet jelly beans are ones that, I mean, they're popular. We, We just had Easter and it's a common Easter candy. But I think there's an important element about jelly beans as a candy that makes them more widely accepted than most things, and it's the variety. Jelly beans generally come in a pack with a bunch of different flavors. And if you're at all a Harry Potter fan, you know that they, they take that to an extreme in a funny way. And uh, as an aside, you can get 
birdie bots every flavor beans and they do have some gross ones um those are available at least they they were a few years ago we like variety i think this is something that um we understate in martial arts a typical martial arts class has what individual work technique work strength work flexibility fun seriousness right think about all the different things that go into one hour long class now show me any other hour of any kind of experience that has that the only thing i the only two settings i can think of that are similar in that way and they don't even come close uh like like a structured fitness class like a crossfit class or yoga but they still rarely have as much variety in my experience the classes i've been to i think we like that i think we end up as martial artists because we appreciate that variance and sometimes we like not knowing the specifics is this red jelly bean a raspberry or a strawberry or a you know a dark bubble gum or i don't know but i'm gonna put it in my mouth what are we doing at class today i don't know but i'm gonna go because more often than not it's worthwhile maybe you don't like licorice yeah see but even if you didn't know what that even if you had a, a bowl of jelly beans and some of them could be licorice let's pretend you couldn't identify by color you'd still eat some I'd risk because it. most of them most most of them are going to be worthwhile right a bad martial arts class it's like eh you know <laughs> I'll come back next time yeah business cards the simultaneously the most overused and underused over underappreciated marketing piece available um let's see if i have one here i want to i want to show people i was going to do a blog post on this uh in a martial arts context and then didn't because i don't think anybody's going to read it that's a whistle kick card do i have i don't have my other ones i don't have my consulting cards so Mm. Now I'm frustrated. Okay. Have you ever gotten a business card that had like the person's home number and their cell number and their fax number and their email address and their website and their physical address and their title and their logo and their boss's name and all of these things on it? Yep. And you're like, holy cow, dude. And you took it and you probably lost it or threw it away because that person forced it on you and the car didn't say anything that you really cared about. Yeah. It was just factual information. Anybody who's, who I've ever given my consulting card to, and I, and, um, you know, I've, I've since changed, like here, the back of my whistle kick card is just the logo. Right. Uh, by the way, rounded corners every time. Don't use right angle corners. My consulting card says Jeremy at jeremylesniak.com because just as a reminder, I do consulting with more than just martial arts schools. So that's, that's like the way I handle that card. But Jeremy at jeremylesniak.com. What do you know right from that? That you you're my first Jeremy name. Lesniak. You know my full name. You can figure out the website and now you've got my email address. Yep. I don't need to write Jeremy Lesniak founder jeremy lesniak consulting jeremy lesniak.com jeremy at jeremy lesniak.com becomes redundant yep when i work with martial arts schools and we talk about business cards we talk about scaling those things back to the important elements and then on the back putting something of value you know for my whistle kick card it's the logo it could be bring this card in for a free class or a free month or whatever it could also be something else it could be uh random tips on bully prevention right you could get 
seven different card series made up and it, you could turn them into kind of like pseudo baseball cards. Right. The point being, if you want someone to find value in something, whether it's the class you teach or the business card you hand them, there has to be value in it for them. Most business cards are just ego on a piece of small paper. And that does not give value to anyone. The only time you're going to care is if it's easier for you to take my business card than to write down my phone number. If you think about the recipient of a business card or any marketing piece, and you prepare it for them, not for you, what do they want? I rarely put anything on the back of business cards that I make now because it's a great place to put notes. Uh, good point. Right. If you think about the recipient and what they want and need, it tends to work out a lot better. But you should always have a business card or two. All right, last one. Okay. Baseball hats. I, I like them. I think this is the oldest whistle kick hat I have. Can you see how dirty it is? I gotta I gotta make a new one. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of falling apart. But I'll put it on for the rest of this this question. I both like and hate hats. They never fit my head quite right. But I don't have hair, so I like hats. I know you like hats. I don't know if it's at all for the same reason. My, uh, I like hats because my head burns very easily. Mm. We have similar uh, ethnic roots. In <laughs> yes. Uh, the lighting is almost good enough. You can see the freckles on the top of my head because I was outside on Sunday. <clears throat> it's a piece of clothing. But that is generally on a baseball hat something that someone finds important, right? You'll wear a pair of Levi jeans, but you're probably not gonna wear a Levi hat. Mm -hmm. There's something about a baseball hat that the things that are on it tend to be very important to us. Those hats started in baseball, literally, uh, um, a team mentality. You became a fan of that team. You wore that hat. You wanted to be like those players. And we've carried that out into life. When I see someone wearing a whistle kick hat, it makes me really happy because it means to me that they are passionate about our mission, that what we're doing as a company means something to them. I don't just wear anything on a hat. A hat's really important. And I see that with martial arts schools. Some of them, very few martial arts schools offer up hats with their logo, but those that do, it's the most passionate students that are wearing that hat. Mm -hmm. There's something about whatever goes on a hat that is important to us. And if you're a school owner and you have a bunch of passionate students and your logo doesn't suck, you should put it on a hat. All right. That was the last one. Okay. Some interesting choices today. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Yes. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah. You, you, you might want to have some... Plan B's for things that start to get out there with pop culture that I may not know. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. No worries. Good, good job on Jelly Babies. So, what's a Jelly Baby? So, Jelly Baby is it's it's shaped like a little person, kind of. It's it's a little bit bigger than a gummy bear. Okay. Kind of the same shape, but it's made from a different type of candy, and the for people that are into Doctor Who know that there are multiple people that have played that same role and the fourth Doctor who in my opinion and I'm pretty sure Mark's opinion as well, the best Doctor the fourth Doctor 
played by Tom Baker, his big thing was he always had a bag of jelly babies in his coat. And he'd be like, jelly baby? And he'd just like, it was like his thing. It was kind of a funny little eccentricity. Um, it's kind of, I mean, jelly bean is a pretty good uh, comparison. So, yeah. I'm envisioning like a, like a Sour Patch Kid. Yeah, not, not the sour. quite. No. You'll you'll have to send me an image or something. Uh, Doctor uh, Who is one of those shows that I've I've just not I, I've never even tried to get into. I I've have had so many people tell me I would enjoy it. Yeah, jelly babies are a type of soft sugar jelly sweets in the shape of plump babies, sold in a variety of colors, and they're from England. Do they actually exist? Oh yeah, well, I, oh, I okay. Still, uh, there's a candy store downtown. Life is sweet. That I'll go down and. Okay, so it's not exclusively to go. Doctor Who. No, it's not. It's okay. not just a Doctor Who thing. Okay, no, I, I understand more. All right. Well, as I told you at the top, kind of our weirdest show format, but fun. And I like fun, and I like different, and I appreciate that Andrew continues to set these up. If you want to throw Andrew a weird word for Word Association Seven, you can email him, Andrew at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio dot com. Why might you email me, Jeremy at whistlekick.com? Here are two biggies. One, you may want to talk about having me work with you on your martial arts school. Would you like to grow your revenue, your profit, your student count? Maybe you have some things around culture you want to work on. You want to improve your student teaching team. I, and the team that we have here can work with you on those things and more. We maintain a 100% success rate. And I will make darn sure that we keep it. So you can email me for that. You could also email me about seminars because I do travel and I do teach and I do have a lot of fun doing that. So if that's something that is of interest to you, just reach out and we can go from there. That's it. Until next time, train hard, smile, smile, and have a great day. day.